welcome everybody to this uh, session uh, uh, hosted between Self Driven, a digital talent engagement platform, and uh, Naluri, which you will hear about uh, from uh, its very own CEO, Azran Osman Rani. Um, I want to preface our discussion with a little bit of something that we have not done uh, in previous webinars, and that is uh, to, to set some context. Uh, in, in, in organizing these webinars, uh, it was really about curating insights for the business community that we hope to keep um, engaging with and, and relating with, uh, even though we're all in, in remote parts of, of, of Asia, right? Um, and so the intention was always to think about what topics would be relevant for discussion among the business community, what would be value adding, and bring together um, thought leaders and partners who would be able to contribute um, um, ideas and insights in this space. Um, it was not about a sales pitch for anybody um, who was involved, least of all ourselves. Um, having said that, what we have learned from previous webinars is that um, unfortunately, <laughs> we, we're, we're, we're suffering from a little bit of an identity crisis, at least among our audience. And so because um, the bulk of our previous webinars have been very much about uh, teaching people, you know, giving value as in upskilling people um, in, in new digital skills um, or giving insights, etc. Various audiences have either thought we were a training company um, or, or a data mining company and all the rest of it. So um, we don't think it serves you if we misrepresent ourselves in that way. And so um, if you will allow us, actually you have no choice unless you leave us, please don't leave us. But we're going to play this very, very short two minute clip just to um, indicate exactly what Self Driven does and um, lay the context for why this topic of performance, high performance and stress management um, is, is close to our hearts um, and therefore why they, we felt there was a synergy between us and Naluri and Azran, but, but um, hopefully you will understand by the end of this webinar, the distinction between what we offer at Self Driven, what, what Naluri does. Um, and so if you have further interest in, in, in um, uh, engaging with either of us for a further exploration of this topic, you will at least know the right way to go about it, right? So with, without any further ado, um, Priya, would you mind just um, playing that short video so everybody at least understands a little bit about uh, what self-driven is and isn't? Yep. want to get straight into the topic and, 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 and make sure that you all uh, get what you came here to, to get, which is really an understanding of um, stress um, and as it relates to being a performance enhancer instead of a performance detractor. And we have, we're very privileged to be joined today by the CEO of Naluri, Azran Osman Rani. Um, and, and so I, I'd like to in case, you know, there are people who have been stuck under a rock and haven't um, yet understood, um, you know, who he is and what he represents. Tell us, Azran, um, in relation to this topic, why should the audience believe that you have anything insightful uh, to say about stress um, and, and linking it to performance? What, what in your experience, whether personal or professional, um, has given you the insights that you feel would be worth sharing with the rest of the audience today? Well, thank you very much, Michelle, for having me. In the last 25 years, I've seen how I've lost all my hair. And it's because of a constant barrage of experiences where nothing goes according to plan, right? So from the big crises of the 98, 99 economic crisis, 2008, 2009, I've had to shut down a whole business and lay off 450 people. I've had to sort of beg money in the face 115 investor rejections for just one funding round um you know and of course in 2018 i got involved in a very uh terrifying car accident while i was cycling and, and that left some 
uh, skull and spinal injuries and some uh, fractured limbs. Uh, so I think going through all of this, uh, there are some principles that I've learned how to keep going despite all of these challenges and setbacks. Absolutely. Well, that, that sounds like a lot to deal with. Um, I actually wasn't aware, Azran, of the, um, the accident portion. So, um, you know, I've been stuck under a rock, at least partially for that. I'm sure that would have made some level of headlines. There was, yeah. May 27, 2018. Goodness. Um, a lot of, obviously, um, very relevant experience, um, both on a professional and personal basis, that has led you to where you are now. And where is that? I mean, for the benefit of the audience who are not familiar with Naluri, how has all that brought you to Naluri? And what is, what is the genesis of Naluri? Well, when I look back and I realized that, you know, the way I got through all of these challenges was to have uh, a really good support network, professionals who helped me, um, you know, pick myself up and keep going, right? And, and then when you look at it in the broader population, there are three major issues that we see with healthcare and in particular mental health today. Number one, it's reactive and transactional. We wait for people who are sick, we wait for people to feel burnt up, then we expect them to reach out. And all the help is transactional, meaning per consultation or per phone call. But these challenges are what's called chronic conditions, whether it's stress, anxiety, depression, or even diabetes, heart diseases, and cancer. You can't fix it with a single visit to a doctor or a psychologist. And so you need a different way of treating that that's also convenient and accessible. The second part is, unfortunately, healthcare is so specialized, it's very siloed. You see a cardiologist for your heart, you see a gastroenterologist for your uh, gut, and you see a dietitian for your food or a psychologist for your mental health. But actually the conditions are very deeply interrelated. And so we need to transform the model of care where a team of professionals provides you personalized guidance rather than you having to chase after individual specialists. And the third is healthcare today is frustrating because um, you know the payers, the insurance companies, the employers, governments, are seeing a cost escalation of about 17% every single year, and yet more people are getting more sick and, and need more help. So something is wrong. And one of the reasons is because it's based on per activity, per consultation, per prescription or treatment, rather than per results, right? So can we do our part to create a quantitative approach and, and really try to bring the payers and providers together to deliver health in a way that is outcomes or results-based instead? Okay, wonderful. And that's something, again, that, that, that uh, notion of being results oriented and outcomes based, um, using collaboration of different um, domains of expertise to encourage people to um, maintain their well being um, and, and um, enhance their performance proactively as opposed to reactively. All these themes are, are, are very much close to our hearts in terms of how we seek to create the ideal employee experience. Um, in companies, so let's let's get straight to it. Um, uh, you mentioned um, in our in our earlier consultations, Azran, that uh, high performance is necessarily stressful. Yep. Um, that's not an intuitive statement to either make or understand. So tell us a little bit about what you mean by that. Okay. Well, first, right? Let's understand a little bit about how our brain works, because the brain has one primary objective, which is to keep you alive. There's a second one on reproduction, but we'll put that one aside for now. Um, and in order to keep us alive, the brain is orienting us to its things that it's familiar with, things that are reliable, comfortable, proven, and it doesn't like anything that's risky, unknown, or uncertain, right? So anything that doesn't go against its familiar patterns, it, it tries to steer you away from it, right? Bad, bad, bad. But the problem is the wor world that we live in today, these new changes are happening almost instantaneously in every day and the brain is struggling to, um, to adapt. Now, when you think about it, whenever the brain sees anything that it's not familiar or comfortable with, it sends stress triggers throughout our body, right? There are cortisol hormones and adrenaline hormones that make your heart beat faster and your lungs to expand and your muscles to be primed, ready to act on it because that is how the brain responds to these threats, right? So here's the thing. If you sense danger, let's say if you were an antelope in the savannah and you see a lion starting to chase after you, these stress hormones help you run away from that lion. But interestingly, the lion also needs stress in order to catch the prey. Because if the lion's heart is not beating faster and its lungs are not expanding and its muscles are not priming, it's not gonna catch the antelope. And after a few days, it's gonna die of starvation. So stress actually becomes necessary 
for survival. Now, what's interesting about the antelope is, you know, if you ever, any of you find yourself caught in, in the savanna and a lion is chasing after you, just remember this one survival tip. You just need to out sprint the lion for 30 seconds because most lions will give up after 30 seconds, right? Because oh. the lion is a sprinter. Right, doesn't have a lot of endurance. So if it doesn't catch you, Michelle, after 30 seconds, it's gonna go, ah, ah, ah. and so the antelope then can see the lion about 50 meters away, having given it up. The antelope's stress levels immediately go away and can start grazing, even though it can still see the lion at the corner of its eye. Right, so animals have this way of, of the stress hormones dissipating. Humans though, unfortunately have evolved where, you know, we may no longer, hopefully, uh, most of us don't have any lions chasing after us, but the same equivalent of a boss being angry at us, a client being upset, our spouse are on our case, we've got mountains of bills to pay, it's the same biological reaction. But here's the catch. The catch is, at least I haven't figured out how to make the boss, the upset client, the angry spouse, and the bills stop after 30 seconds <laughs> keep going on and on and on Anyone again Anyone has that product sign me up a few of that right so therefore suddenly the biological reactions like you know gone unstable because the body hasn't had a chance for the stress hormones to dissipate okay now here's an interesting thing i really want to share with you a very powerful study in 2011 which measured right two groups of people who are experiencing a lot of stress to compare with a third control group of people who are not experiencing any stress pressures. But in the first group, these are people who believed that stress is necessary and it's important for them to act. And another group believed that stress is bad and it's meant to be avoided. I, sh I shouldn't be experiencing stress. Okay. That group who experienced stress but thought stress was bad, ended up having a 43% higher likelihood of a heart attack and death. Mm -hmm. Whereas the group that believed that stress is important and necessary did not have any higher level of uh, mortality than the group who was not experiencing any stress. So right? So basically, how are you able to get to be that? I mean, that, that sounds great. Right. I, I, I don't want to be in the headed for death zone. Uh, but it's, I guess it's easier said than done, right? As in, how do I, how do I do that? Well, you're going to have to stick around and we'll tell you how. But the other analogy I want to give you this is think of Usain Bolt, the world 100 meter record uh, holder, right? Now, if you put Usain Bolt, hey, Usain, come to, uh, come to Malaysia. Here's an empty stadium, 100 meters, go, right? See how fast you can run. He's not even going to come close to 10 seconds let alone his world record time of 9.8 seconds. The only way he can get to 9.858 seconds is if he has seven other of the world's top competitors racing next to him, if he's got 100,000 people in the stadium, if he's got 100 million people watching live, mm -hmm. right? But what Usain has trained to do is to take that external stimulus from competition and channel it to performance rather than being crippled by that pressure. Right. And so, again, if you don't have stress, you're not going to be able to perform at your best. And another very interesting example. Right. You know, if, if I were to ask anyone here, how many of you think you can run not just one full marathon, but two full marathons back to back 84 kilometers nonstop without any training? Can you guys do that? I would hazard a guess they would ask you, are you crazy? Like, does that is that a sign of you know, okay. mental health? So that's the sign that, yeah, I am crazy, but that's not the point. But the point is, I can actually make you do that, right? Now, I'm going to be weird, but I'm going to put a gun to your head. Actually, even better, let me put the gun to someone that you love as a hostage, right? And if you don't, if you stop running, I'm going to kill your loved one. Now, forgive me, I'm not normally this evil, right? But under that extreme stress, what happens is this. Our bodies normally send us signals, including pain, to give up when we start to only reach 60 to 65% of our body's capacity, right? It's the body's way of saying, slow down, slow down, slow down, right? But actually, we've got a lot more reserve, right? But it's once you're experiencing hyper stress, actually, the body's really primed for action, which is why, right, when uh, take weight lifters. During training where they're experiencing pain and they get more comfortable with pain, they can push that threshold from 65 to 80%. But here's the one interesting thing. When they get to the Olympics, right, 
if training there at 60 at 80 percent at the olympics with all that pressure national expectations and live telecast these guys can go another 12 percent to 92 percent of their max physical capability right so the pressure to perform can actually increase our level of performance right so stress is necessary which is why another another experiment hopefully one of these days we can all get on a plane and start flying again right yeah so any of you are nervous flyers you know how sometimes it's turbulence like oh my god oh my god what's going to happen right here's an interesting thing if you start to repeat to yourself hey this is exciting when i get home i'm going to tell my friends and you repeat that 10 times your body will start to react differently because you have framed the situation as instead of fear to excitement. Fear and excitement, by the way, biologically are the exact same thing or virtually identical in terms of the biochemical reactions to our body. But how we respond to it changes everything. Hmm. That's why some people are so excited about going on a roller coaster or skydiving and other people are terrified of it, even though the stimulus itself is the same exact thing. So why is it that some people can thrive under that extreme pressure and other people feel crippled. And a big part of that, number one, is, you know, I think it's bad for me, right? I want to avoid it, right? And the single biggest thing is when we think what happens to us, we have no control. Mm, control correct. is the starting point. Now, you might think, I have no control over my angry boss. I have no control over my client. I definitely have no control over my upset spouse or the mounting bills to pay it. Now, you may not be able to think of control as in I can somehow wave a magic wand, but there is a big difference between there is nothing I can do to saying, well, hang on, what are the specific actions that I can take, even in a situation where I do not have power to start to change my situation, then feeling like I'm the complete victim and I'm just lying down expecting to somehow wish that my boss goes away. Absolutely. Right. If I might, if I might, Azran, just take a bit of a pause there, um, just to check in with the audience, because I know that uh, uh, you had prepared some visuals for us. Um, yep. I personally am, you know, completely understanding and getting and very engaged with what you're telling us so far. But I'm conscious that among the hundred or so folks that are with us, not everyone may be oral learners, and some yep. may be visual learner, uh, uh, learners. Okay. Um, can we can we have an indication from the chat? Is, is everyone happy to continue along this um, visual storytelling mode of understanding the insights? Um, is anyone, um, if, if, you, if you feel that you need um, some of the visuals, please indicate in the chat, let us know. Um, uh, and, and certainly I think Azran would be happy to, to make use of the prepared material. Let me, let me just jump in anyway. Sure. Right? So first, what is the difference between stress, anxiety, and depression? Because we need to understand that, right? So remember, stress is that feeling when there's a threat at us. We thought, well, in the old days, it was a lion chasing after us. Today, it is, you know, angry boss, you know, upset client, uh, you know, spouse and, and mounting bills to pay. And the difference is, unlike that antelope, right, it doesn't stop to the point where we humans have developed something called anxiety. And anxiety is basically the threat hasn't materialized. I'm already feeling it in my body. So the boss is not yet angry at me. The client is not upset. The, my, my spouse is not upset yet, but I'm already feeling that, that biological reaction. Anticipating that future potential threat is called anxiety, right? Depression is basically once a threat has already passed, I'm still feeling it. I can't let go. So the boss is no longer upset at me. My spouse is okay. And, and you know, I, I've already paid my bills but I can't let go of that terrifying feeling that I used to go in. For some people, even childhood trauma can bring back these feelings again and again and again, and it doesn't stop, right? And so what happens is instead of those thoughts go away, they, the videos keep playing in our heads over and over again of anxious threats, potential threats of the future or depressing past threats or depressing threats from the past, right? So, so basically, right, what we, what we then do is we say, well, let's try to quantify this and, and, and understand it. How prevalent is this? And so when we measure this, this is probably over 10,000 Malaysian white collar employees, right? Mostly in KL, but also in some of the bigger cities in Malaysia. And you can see that about 40% of people have elevated levels of depression, 60% have elevated levels of anxiety, 30% have elevated levels of stress. 
with some 8 to 12% of people having very severe levels. And we're going to talk about that, the difference between severe and kind of a moderate level of stress, anxiety, and depression. And I would imagine, Azran, just to write yeah. that these, um, these stats and these figures would be indicative of, of other places like Singapore as well, um, around, around Africa overall. Would that be fairly indicative as well? It, it should be, but this is sort of like our own Nullary client uh, experience, right? right. Now, well, here's an interesting thing, which um, you know, I, I thought was quite interesting. Imagine if we could slice that data and looked at the people who are under 30 versus people who are above 40. And guess what? People who are under 30 were experiencing between 40 to almost 80% higher levels of stress, anxiety, depression than people who are above 40. And so there's a long conversation about this, why there are structural generational differences right, from uh, mm. feeling a lot more financial pressure because cost of living had gone much faster than wages to, you know, uh, growing up in the internet generation, right, we're constantly overwhelmed with choice that we can't actually decide on one specific option and, and stick to it. Okay. Uh, but first, right, the other thing is stress, anxiety, and depression can be either biological so it's actually the same thing as diabetes. What is diabetes? Diabetes is when a hormone in our body called insulin, because we're constantly feeding it all kind of sugar and processed food, it no longer is able to regulate uh, our blood sugar levels, right? But some of the people, uh, there are hormones that affect our mood, right? Our positive moods, our attitudes called serotonin or dopamine, but there may be a biological factor that now those hormones are no longer able to regulate itself. Right? Some, there is some element of genetics, so it can pass down from one uh, generation to the other. There are also psychological factors, like how we think, how we're coping with the situations. And there's also social issues right, from our friends, our finances, etc., that contribute to stress, anxiety, and depression. But here's the thing. First of all, I want to say that stress, anxiety, and depression are completely normal. If you've never experienced any of this, you are a robot or, or, or a, you know, a, a machine, right? Mm -hmm. So feeling sad, feeling fatigued, feeling that you can't sleep, feeling anxious, these are all completely normal feelings. So I want to start with that because that's important, right? But it's also important to understand when you think about depression, these are the sorts of feelings that people experience. And when you think about anxiety, these are the sorts of things that people experience. Now, this becomes important when you want to understand your colleagues or your family members who may be going through this. So this allows us to better understand what are the symptoms? What does depression look like? What does anxiety look like? Right? But most of us, most of us can self-regulate, right? Where within a few days, that feeling goes away, right? Me that maybe because after a good night's sleep or for me, always works ice cream. You give me a tub of ice cream, I'm going to feel so much better in the next couple of hours. Non-intuitive, but there you go. You know, triathlete, gym in the background, but still, ice cream is on the cards. Ice cream is, is my go <laughs> Yes, or, or, or kind of spending time outdoors. Okay. But the difference for some other people is that when they are not able to self-regulate and self-recover, it starts to become a clinical condition. It is when the symptoms that I described earlier start to persist longer than even one to two weeks, or that the degree of these symptoms seem to not get any better, or it may even be worsening, right? Uh, and despite your efforts to self-regulate, you still can't do this. And in particular, sleep. Sleep is the single most important indicator. If you're struggling for sleep, if you can't get a good you know, six, seven hours at least straight, if you keep waking up in the middle of the night constantly, more than two or three nights in a row, that becomes uh, a signal that you're going to need help, that your body is no longer in a state where you can solve this by yourself. Okay. Now, I want to come back to... Um, you know, what happens when we've got all these overwhelming thoughts? I want to share with you this one analogy. You know, Michelle, when I spent a day in Langkawi uh, doing the Ironman triathlon, I burned 6,000 calories from swimming, cycling, and running, right? I will lose several kilos of weight after after day of racing. 6,000 kilos is like, sorry, 6,000 calories is like 10 plates of nasi lemak. Oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> but here's the thing. A world champion chess grandmaster competing in a world championship chess tournament can burn 6,000 calories. Now, not from moving physical chess pieces, but because the brain is working on an overdrive 
thinking 50 moves ahead and multiple scenarios, it literally is consuming so much energy. These guys will lose two to three kilos of weight from playing chess. Wow. Okay. So those midnight munchies, when I'm pulling an all nighter with that pitch deck, <laughs> that's why I reach out for the, for the midnight snack then. That's why it is, right? It's not well, chair. Exactly. It's brain power. Because the brain is only 2% of our body's weight, but it consumes 20% of our energy. It is the most energy intensive organ. That is why when we're feeling overwhelmed, when we're feeling stressed, we become fatigued, we become tired, right? And you start actually, the body's reaching out for sugar. Mm. Because sugar is a quick boost of energy, right? But here's the problem. This is why stress leads to diabetes. Because in a short burst, that's okay. But when you no longer are dealing with lions chasing after you, but instead, uh, but instead you're not faced with the boss, the angry spouse, the upset client, who is not stopping after 30 seconds, the body's not able to self-regulate and you still keep eating sugar and it's creating this big spike, right? And that's why your body's actually breaking apart as a result of constant or chronic stress. Now, here's the one part, right? How does, how does these thoughts keep playing in our head? So remember, depression and anxiety are these videos of future threats or past threats that are still playing in our heads. Right. Why does the body keep reaching out to these threats that are not in the present? And the first thing is the brain, when left, when you don't train it, likes to wander around. In fact, 47% of our waking hours, the brain is thinking of something else other than what we're doing right now. In fact, for half of you who are listening to this webinar, you're actually not listening to me. But you're <laughs> checking your news feed or, or, you know, replying to that WhatsApp message. I can see you there or you're <laughs> You're trying or, to multiple. or even if they are paying attention, Azran, they're like looking at you. They could be looking at me. They could be looking at the screen. But to your point, their minds could be somewhere completely different. Right. So herein lies the problem, right? Simultaneous multitasking is creating a proliferation of depression and anxiety because we have to get down to this because you know, this more than anything else is the start of why we're feeling stressed because we think you're being productive trying to do multiple things at once like answering that whatsapp message and checking your facebook feed replying to the email while you're kind of like half listening to me your brain actually is not doing three or four things at once it is actually really able to I just want to highlight to you, Azran, that uh, we've got a flurry of messages on the chat insisting and, you know, validating that they are indeed listening to you. You know, no, 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 no. We're all listening. We're all here for you, Azran. We're all here for you now. Right. <laughs> Please carry on. This is, this is so, so crucial because people are doing this. We live in a world that I'm called, we're bombarded by notifications, right. notifications from our phone and from our laptop computers. And it's distracting the brain because every time the brain has to hop from one task to the other, it actually uses up more energy, right? So for example, right, let me give you this test and I'll, I'll, I'll spare our audience today. But imagine if I asked you, what's 18 times seven? And then after that, go to the right hand side, uh, come up with a sentence with a fish and a bicycle, right? And then go back to 52 plus 19, quick, quick, quick. And then what's, you know, kind of an apple and an eye, make a sentence, right? And then what's 46 minus 38? You see, if you keep hopping between two different tasks, if we actually did this, right, people who will try to do this one simple task will take 20% longer than people who, for example, did all the math problems first, and then they move to the creative problems next. 20% longer. Because every time you're shifting gears, the brain has to restart. It's a bit like driving your car, accelerate, brake, accelerate, brake, accelerate, brake. What do you think is going to happen to your car engine? And what do you think is going to happen to your fuel efficiency? Right? Okay. And so I think that's important because we've got someone in the chat. Rajashri is, um, is saying that, you know, uh, agree with everything, but multitasking is actually required by bosses nowadays, Azran. And I guess what you've just indicated is that uh, it's a fallacy to think that multitasking is, is productive. And in, in fact, what you've just said is ultimately it leads us to being not as productive as we think. Right. Correct? So, so let me, let me clarify this because this is the single biggest issue as a result of work from home. Many managers today, right. Are feeling uncomfortable because they were never trained to manage a remote team. They were used to seeing everybody in the office. Right. And so when they don't see you, they think, are you watching Netflix? Are you sleeping on your couch? Why are you not working? Why are you not immediately answering my WhatsApp message, right? And this is what's completely causing 
the, the heightened stress during this COVID-19 pandemic. Specifically, by the way, because Naluri quantifies stress, anxiety, depression, we saw pre-March 18th and then from March to end of May, our quantitative level of depression and anxiety jumped by 42%. It's come down by about 18%, but it's still 20% higher than pre-March 18th because of this one single thing that people are expecting instant responses, right? Mm -hmm. Now, all of us have multiple responsibilities. We need to have multiple tasks. But what I'm saying is trying to do things simultaneously is the big issue, which means instead of uh, you know, trying to do multiple things at once, try to block things in 25 minutes, right? So in 25 minutes, I'm gonna get this Microsoft Word report done. Then I'm gonna move on to spend 15 minutes to clear all my email inbox, done. Then I'm gonna to move to do, doing these things, one thing at a time, rather than shifting from one to the other. That is the single biggest issue. And in fact, from a management point of view, right? This is why it's so important to define when do we need our team members to be, to have synchronous communications, meaning I talk, you respond, versus when does it need to be asynchronous. That is why for us, for example, we say synchronous communications is morning check-ins, nine to 9.15, evening checkouts, 5.45 to six, so you, you're clear what got done, what were the problems that need to continue the next day, and only under specific explicit circumstances do we say, yes, this is urgent enough that the work needs to continue at night. And remember, if you, you expect your team members to keep working in the middle of the night for three weeks in a row, they're gonna experience burnout. Absolutely. Because what we're going through right now, this is not a sprint. It is a marathon. It's going to last for more than a year. So you need to think about your team members' stamina. And that is why collaboration tools that are asynchronous become so crucial. Bosses want status updates. But the status update should not come from, you need to reply to my WhatsApp message. It means, you know, I update my collaboration tool, my project management tool. And that is how you need to define team communication protocols on status updates so that it's very clear. Doing this one thing is going to help us significantly address stress and anxiety in the workplace. Absolutely. And if I may just, um, you know, uh, offer some input there as well, what we found to be very, very effective in dealing exactly with what you've discussed, um, keeping managers um, uh, sort of comfortable um, managing without seeing is really creating the necessary framework and platform so that the most impactful goals are the ones that um, people are working on. So if you have a mechanism, um, and, and ideally it'd be on a, on, a, on, a, on a platform that is visible and easily accessible to everybody to make sure your team knows exactly what is expected of them and you reward them for doing that, then you can basically let them get on with doing their job as opposed to, uh, to your point, you know, constantly micromanaging and checking up on them, which is going to lead to that stress. Sure. But let's, let's talk about that as well, because one of the problems is that there, there are a lot of these managers out there who are just hammering their team members. This is where, you know, you have two choices, really. You can't control what happens to you, but actually you have a lot more control on how you respond to it rather than just saying there's nothing I can do, right? So even when you may perceive to not have power, you do have several degrees of um, several levers that you can pull, right? For example, number one, right? If you wanted to figure out how do I ask for something from my boss, right? You get to pick when you bring that issue up, mm -hmm. right? That actually is power because everybody has good times and bad times. Observe and learn and figure out what's the right time to bring up to my boss. The second thing is if you go to your boss and you say, um, I need flexibility to you know, manage my kids at home, you're basically just asking someone and you're dependent on his or her graciousness to grant you that, right? right. That's never a good thing in, in business or in life where you're just asking for someone. What you got to start the conversation with is let me first understand what is important to my boss. Mm -hmm. right? And then say, hey, boss, what is important? Well, what's important is this you know, proposal needs to get done by this Friday. That is so crucial that we win this project. Awesome, right? And then once you know that, you can position, look, I really need to be, I, I really want to be able to deliver on that commitment, right? In order for me to do that, I'm going to take these blocks of time to really focus on getting that done. This is how I'm going to communicate with you and, and get back to you on updates so that you feel comfortable that I'm getting there. So positioning it not as just, I need something, but I'm, I need, you know, I want to support you, 
right? And so that again is also another important way when we want to ask for someone something from someone who's got more power first understand what's important to them right absolutely and then and framing it to exactly your point the outcomes that will be achieved if both parties uh you know collaborate on the the, the how of right. getting there so wonderful wonderful tip thank you azran and and the, the other thing don't don't underestimate the power of mirroring right which is basically how is that other person? How can I actually mirror that person, right? Literally in terms of if they're sitting in a single certain way, you sit in that same way. If they start to gesture, you start to gesture. Literally, because people are subconsciously drawn and are more comfortable with um, people that are familiar to them, right? So there are a lot of these things. And, and that's what our, our coaches and our psychologists do on the Nullity program is to help people who are going through these very challenging uh, situations and saying, okay, let's try a few techniques this week, right? And figure out what works and what doesn't work. Okay, let's build on that the next week and the next week and the next week. The whole idea is we need to move from a state of I'm a victim, there's nothing I can do, I can't control my boss, to what are the two or three things I can start doing to start kind of making incremental progress in my situation to kind of uh, influence my boss, despite the fact that I have no power. Okay, great. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, again, take a bit of a pause there. What we've covered so far um, is uh, a discussion on how stress actually is imperative to high performance. Right. And Adam gave us some, some, some very good examples um, of that. Uh, we touched a little bit on um, reframing some of the stressful situations you may experience in, in especially current times uh, and how then um, you are able to utilize the external stresses uh, to your advantage. We spent a little bit of time on that. Um, there's been a checklist of what is normal stress versus um, stress that maybe needs a little bit more attention that you need to watch out for within yourself as well as the people you are close to. And if they are going beyond that one or two weeks um, of these symptoms, then that's a signal for them to reach out. Um, we did say that we were going to uh, give some uh, um, tips on how you might uh, address um, with, with, a, with, a, with a colleague or, or a loved one when you start seeing them come close to those danger zones um, so that they would be receptive to that message. Um, I, I'd love to have you address that, Azran. And, and for the rest of you on the call and hopefully still paying as much attention as you profess to be doing, uh, please feel free to now use the chat now that we've got, got given you some, some mental concepts to kind of chew on. Um, what is it that's in your mind right now? What is more relevant? What would you like to deep dive into so that we can make sure in the last 20, 25 minutes um, left of this call, we, we absolutely give you the privilege of um, answering your direct question since you've made the effort to come to the webinar as opposed to wait for the replay. Um, so, so Azran's gonna get into, you know, how do we approach um, people, colleagues, loved ones that we see getting into those danger zones so that they're receptive to having um, us tell them that they need to maybe seek help. Yeah. And, and for the rest of you, please um, tell us in the chat where you'd like us to deep dive. Right. So I'm going to uh, share one framework, ACT, ACT. How do we act to support our colleagues, right? A for assess, right? Assess not just our colleague, but actually assess us first, right? In order for us to assess ourselves, we need to know are we in the right state of mind to approach someone? Right? Because we, we may be stressed, we may be agitated. You try to help someone when you're in that state, you're actually going to amplify the situation. Right? Then the next thing is uh, all the symptoms that I shared earlier, try to assess is that what, um, is that what my colleague is going through? Right? And once you know the symptoms, is this something that's just for one or two days or is it persistent? I'm seeing this for more than a week. Right? So then I need to know, okay, this is where I need to be able to intervene. Okay? C, console, right, or, or check in, right? And the, the most important thing here is definitely this. Number one, we are not professionals, so we need to stop our instinct to solve their problems. This is usually the biggest issue. Most well-meaning friends and family members are actually making situations worse because you think you can solve it. I yeah, just do this, just snap out of it, just see my guy. That's not helpful, right? What is helpful is to just check in and say, how are you doing? You know, uh, you know, is there anything I can do to help you, right? Just some people may not be ready to be helped, right? But at least what you're doing is you're, you're validating what they're experiencing and you're just saying, I'm here 
for your support if you if you need to. If it's a family member, even helping with errands. Hey, you know what? You seem busy. Do you need me? Do you need help getting groceries for this week or, or getting the laundry done? Let me do that because you need to give them space to process it, right? But the T part is when you take action. When you take action, when it's already uh, gone more than two weeks long, it's already, you know, for example, when they explicitly started to use language of self-harm, right? They use language of depressiveness, like life is, has no meaning, you know, uh, I, I, I have nothing else to live for. These are words where you say, I need to take action. And this is where you say, well, okay, this is where as friends or family members, we need professional help, right? And whether it is uh, calling hotlines, and that's why in, in Nullary, we have a 24 seven hotline for our clients to call and immediately get help so that um, professionals can be brought in. Okay. Right? Kind of, that's kind of how we, we want to be able to kind of first assess and then check in and console. And then, you know, if, it, if, it, if they're not willing to open up and they're continuing to be in a self-destructive manner, how do you then take action and escalate? So I think um, given the fact that we're not professionals, uh, I guess um, as, as non-professionals, what we can do uh, is to uh, alert them to our observations that these are some symptoms that we have observed, right. which I think, you know, everyone can say, I don't need to be a psychiatrist to notice that you've not been sleeping, da, 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 and this has happened more than two weeks or whatever the case may be. And therefore, because I care about you, I just want to make, uh, alert you to this fact that I'm observing this. Have you, are you aware of it? Right. Um, and then lead them to that conversation of how I'm seeking help. Uh, the other thing to avoid is now is not the time or, or when, when we experience this, that is not the time for you to bring up your experience. Right. right? If your friend is going through a very challenging period. You're not helping by saying, oh, that sounds like what I went through, you know, 10 years ago. And this is what I did. You might be well intentioned thinking that, hey, I've got experience to share with you. That is not helpful. That's not helpful at all for you to bring up you because it's not about you. It is about them. Right. So your job is to basically say, hey, whatever you're going through, I hear you. It's real. It's not something to be brushed over. Whatever help you need, I'm here for you. That is all you need to do. Do not try to bring your experiences and do not try to solve their problems. Because what worked for you may not necessarily work for them, right? Exactly. We're right. actually getting some, um, some questions now that are on areas that people want to deep dive into, Azran. Yep. Uh, Rajashree is actually interested to understand about how to help. Because what, what we've discussed so far um, mm -hmm. is very much in the, in the adult domain. Um, and, you know, colleagues at work, um, people we care about at home. What about kids, you know? Uh, kids are certainly obviously not 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 uh, in, invulnerable to the to the stresses of, of homeschooling or, or, or the pandemic as well. So how do we how do we um, help kids as young as eight years old uh, to overcome stress? In your experience, yeah. So for, first of all, that is a completely different specialization, child psychology, right? And uh, you know, what, for example, for us, we don't have the expertise to sort of help kids, nor do I think digital solutions is right for children. But what we do is we help the parents, right? Because the parents are going through uh, the challenges, right? And it's about getting the parents to first describe the pressures that they're faced under. The first thing normally from a parent point of view is that first part A, assess yourself. Are you in the right state of mind? Because oftentimes the big issues is when the parent is feeling stress and it can be taken out on the child and make the situation worse. Mm -hmm. Right. I think on, that's kind of what I do. The other part is, you know, how then do we um, point them to getting professional child psychological support? Because f first thing is, is this uh, ongoing? Could it be a learning, uh, you know, disability? Could there have been a traumatic experience uh, in school or somewhere else? There's a there's kind of a whole checklist that we have to go through because children aren't going to tell us exactly what they're experiencing. And, and there are there are techniques that I'm not qualified to talk about in terms of how do we engage children to really understand what's behind what they're feeling. But I, I guess um, uh, we can we can certainly take the airplane analogy of making sure that before we put an oxygen mask on our younger loved ones, we're first to your point assessing ourselves and making sure that we're okay, that we have our oxygen mask on ourselves uh, and be in a position to at least be able to listen fully um, and, and make the child feel safe. That's in right. expressing um, some of the what they feel are the um, symptoms of their stress, what what they believe to be causing 
um, the stress and, and therefore then, you know, um, as the adult, you start uh, your root cause analysis and then, you know, deep diving further how you can help them. So, so going from children, another question we've got um, and, or an observation is um, from Abdul Hakim, who says, since stress and depression are one of the highest risk factors of dementia disorders, like Alzheimer's, with increasing stress, um, in your experience, does that put more people on the, on the older edge, uh, end of the spectrum at risk of dementia in the shortcoming future? And with your insights or experience, I mean, what, what do it to prevent that? Okay, that's a, that's a very good point. So um, you, we can actually build mental fitness, right? We sometimes think mental health is an illness or weakness. But actually, just like physical health, on one hand, you're, you've got someone who's diabetic or hypertensive or, or overweight, but you also have someone who's kind of strong and healthy and fast and flexible, right? And so likewise, it's important to understand that there's the positive aspect of mental health, right? What is positive mental health? Positive mental health is resilience, the ability to pick yourself up when you get stuck. Positive mental health is focus, the ability to have one attention for you know, 25, 30 minutes instead of kind of mind wandering around that is that is actually a trained skill that we can train the brain's muscles to focus can, can you give us a specific example of that because i would hazard a guess that everyone on this call would know at least one person who cannot sit at the dining table without checking their phones right so again like if i if i were to take you to this gym right and you've never been to the gym and just start getting you to spend six hours doing weights and doing cardio what's going to happen to you are you going to get strong no you're going to get so tired and sore you'll swear yourself never to go to the gym again right so same exact thing the same way we train our physical muscles is the same way we train our mental muscles which is what are the starting points how do i build consistency over time and i'm actually going to get mentally stronger i'm going to build my focus muscles so let's start with this right one of the key things about um, uh, building mental fitness is learning mindfulness. Now, mindfulness means a lot of things, right? Some people think, oh, is that this meditation thing where you kind of sit and do deep breathing exercises? Yes, that helps, but that doesn't mean that's the only way to practice mindfulness. Mindfulness is basically something we can incorporate in everything that we do in our lives, which means tonight when we have dinner, let's have dinner with our family members and put that phone away and switch off that TV so that we're engaging in the present, right? Rather than being the thoughts going all over the place to the past and to the future. The more you do that, the more you're going to get better at it, right? Um, one of the key things to learn about um, building that focus muscle is the, the neurochemicals of mental focus is the same as visual focus or very similar, right? And so one of the ways we can train ourselves to build our mental focus is by learning to focus visually on one thing, right? So for example, if you're going to look at me, see if you can look at me for, you know, two or three minutes without looking somewhere else. The more you train, actually, you're going to get better at this, right? Over uh, weeks and months, you're going to get better by learning mental focus. And the real test, whether you truly can get the benefit of uh, becoming more mindful is this. It's not like some kumbaya thing. It is when you experience that next shock factor where the boss is screaming at you or the client is really upset or your spouse is angry or your bills, mounting bills to play, are you reacting impulsively or are you responding thoughtfully? Mm -hmm. The more you, you, you will know you've, you've gotten the benefits of mindful practice is when you can not be triggered immediately because there are only two ways of being triggered, right? I either start to become very defensive and I challenge with whoever is triggering me or I start to become self-defeating and I blame myself. Oh, I'm so terrible. I'm sorry. I'm, ter I'm terrible. Those are the two ways. But there's a third way of, of, of uh, responding rather than that impulsive reaction, right? Which requires, for example, to say, hmm, upset, threat, can you tell me more? Repeat what they say. Not that you're trying to agree or disagree with what they're saying, but you're kind of like validating what they're saying and then asking them to elaborate. That means that gives you time to process how you react. So if you practice your, your um, that mental exercises, uh, you're going to be in a much better way of dealing with that. So right now I'm gonna give one specific exercise that we can all do right now. How do we train that mental focus? This is going to be, this is called a grounding exercise. Five, four, three, two, one, right? Number one, five, sorry. Name five things that you can see around you right now. 
feel free to name me as one of your five. Azran, laptop, mic, lights. Awesome. Okay, name four things that your skin can touch and feel right now. Hand, thighs, table. I'm the only one doing this, but I'm assuming, I'm, I'm assuming people are doing this. And right. Name three things that you can hear around you right now. Azran. Azran, that's one of them. That's the Michelle. First, okay, Michelle, you know, maybe the air con or the fan or some background noise, right? Name two things that you can smell right now. That one, please don't pick me. <laughs> now, if you focus, you can. You can probably get a couple of uh, scents, right? And the last thing, name one thing that you can still taste in your mouth right now. Lunch. Okay. <laughs> When you engage in your five senses for that one brief moment, your brain will have paused those anxious thoughts of the future and the depressing thoughts of the past. And even if it's a one minute relief, it counts, right? And the best way I can tell you this is, you know, when I, when I race in a triathlon, Michelle, what's the difference between running the marathon portion of an Ironman triathlon and a standalone marathon, like the standard chocolate marathon? What do you think is the main difference? God, you're like you're swimming and you're running. Uh, you're swimming and you're cycling is the stupid person's answer, I suppose. I'm sure you're going to tell me the intelligent person. Uh, so, you know, you, you, have you noticed these standalone marathons? They start pre-dawn, right? At 4 a.m., right? Right. Okay. You don't want them to be too hot, right? right. So you, 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 but when you do an Ironman triathlon, you first got to swim four kilometers, then you got to bike 180 kilometers. By the time you start running, it is high noon, right? And the sun is beating on you. And so what do triathletes do when they have to run? They look for tree shade. Right. When you're running under tree shade, even though it's like two seconds of respite, over 42 kilometers, it makes a huge difference. Wow. There's this nonstop pounding of that heat on your, especially when you don't have any more protection up here. Right? Hey. So small seconds matter because okay. life is a long period. So even taking that one minute pause, right, allows us to, take control and not react impulsively, right? Okay. So literally sometimes when you're facing this threat that, that we talk about, hmm, five things that I see, four things that I can touch and feel, three things that I can hear, two things that I can smell, one thing. It just allows your brain to come back to the present and allow you to respond. And that is the equivalent of that shaded spot in life's marathon. That's it is right. brilliant. I'm conscious that we are at the top of the hour, but we have two, um, I think, very valid uh, statements and questions in the chat that I'd love for us to be able to address. And I know um, that Azran said that he's not running off anywhere. Um, I, I'd like for us to be able to, to answer this if, you, if, if we can, um, Azran. The first sure. is that uh, Yin Mi from Singapore is saying sometimes stressed people go into a free situation not wanting to do anything because it's also socially not acceptable for us to admit or even discuss having anxiety or depression. So that's one issue like the whole um, uh, the, 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 the stigma against being not okay. Right. Yep. And um, secondly, um, uh, Jennifer is asking if our bosses are going through some kind of anxiety or depression right. and it starts manifesting at work in a negative way and, you know, they're taking it out on everybody, any, any, any tips for that? And then someone, Abdul Hakim has just snuck in, you know, last bit there, uh, uh, a question. Would you agree that people are more aware of their physical health and their mental health? Why is that? So I think that kind of goes into the first question, as in it's okay to talk about physical health and going to the gym, men, um, physical right. fitness, but not about mental fitness. We don't talk about that. Right. Um, and I think, okay, I'm going to take this as a last question from Ravin. Ravin, just because I like you so much. Um, how important do you think employees should practice breathing exercises to managing anxiety? So that's, I think, the three questions that we can have time okay. for. All right. So, so quick, rapid response. Number one, you know, when I experienced that accident and I was lying in that hospital bed, um, I was think I was overwhelmed with these big, big unanswerable questions like, you know, am I going to be able to walk again? How do I take care of my family? Do I have to shut down my businesses? And the worries were going around because there was no answers to it. Now, luckily for me, I've got my team of dietitians and psychologists and, and people who are helping me. They help me say, hang on, right? Those things we have no answers about. What can you control today? What can you act on today, right? And that was where I said, okay, let's, let's just focus on scooting off the bed and learning to take the first few steps. Just kind of moving that into a state of action. That helped me 
cause all those crazy thoughts. And I wouldn't have been able to do that on my own. Despite everything that I know, I was so overwhelmed with my situation. So I need people around me to be my mirrors and to help me focus on what are the controllable actions that I can take. And so even in Singapore, right, pick up the phone because there's so many resources as they are here in Malaysia, just having to, first of all, explain to someone what you're going through that's independent so that you don't feel judged by, you know, well-meaning colleagues or family members because we, you know, it's hard to be open in that way. But there are people who are objective, who don't judge, who will just listen. And the act of having to explain yourself will help clarify your thoughts and they can then help give you suggestions on the two or three things that you can act on. Focus on what you can act on, right? And that's why creating these support structures are very important. Okay. Okay. So on, on, yeah. yeah. On the issue of, you know, you know, my boss is just kind of, again, taking out on me. Um, look, I, I don't have a, a silver bullet answer to like suddenly fixing a, a very difficult boss. Right. But ultimately in a toxic environment, you have two choices, right? Do I, do I stay or do I go? Right. And, and for most people right now, look, I have no choice. I've got to stay. Right. But this is again, where, where's the help that I can need so that, I, first of all, understand that that anger that's being thrown at me has, is not a judgment on myself. Mm. This is the single biggest problem people have when they take it as something is wrong with me. The problem is with the boss, right? And we need to, again, learn all these techniques about saying, hmm, what is he going through or she's going through? And, you know, how can I help that person rather than feeling that they're judging you? It's really tough when you're being, you know, fire is being, you know, thrown in, in your face. But again, this is where the techniques come in so that we can respond rather than feel very defensive when it's uh, thrown at us. Someone once, just to add to that, Azra, someone once gave me a tip, you know, when dealing with a particularly difficult um, personality, if you can visualize them as being covered in bloody bandages um, from some kind of emotional trauma or whatnot that they have experienced in the past that has led them to now become this quite, you know, uh, person that, that, is, that is a struggle for you to deal with, that, that people are generally not born horrible, right? We were all born lovely, lovely people and things happen to us in life that whether we can accept it or not. So if you can visualize someone being wrapped in bandages, that you have more, perhaps more empathy for where they might be coming from. And to your point, um, uh, try to uh, reframe anything that you need from them in terms of a mutually beneficial outcome if they were to treat you better, for example. Um, and, and of course, that's a whole different uh, conversation again about giving feedback in a, in a constructive way. Yep. Um, what are your thoughts about uh, the breathing exercises that uh, Ravin is very keen to, to hear from you on? Yes, absolutely. Go for it. By the way, if, if, uh, if you're looking for something else, some people are, are very bored with breathing and, and you are in a work remote environment, I highly recommend team jigsaw puzzles, right? Okay. Give all your team members who are working remotely a, the same jigsaw and every few nights, ask everyone to take a picture of the, um, you know, the progress that they're making. So you create a bit of competition, right? But jigsaw puzzles are super important because they're visual and they're spatial, right? And it's about kind of progress, incremental progress. It allows them to channel something in the present rather than all the overwhelming thoughts. So that's another um, thing that you can do. Interesting. Obviously putting some kind of uh, still, uh, it's got to be complete within a week probably, right? Otherwise it's just, you know, never. That, that's again. your competitive streak, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> so similarly, unfortunately, uh, we have gone five minutes past the hour. All good things, there has to be an ending. Even if you have got a jigsaw puzzle, you've got to tell the team, right, I'm giving you a week or two weeks, that's it. So um, I really, really appreciate the fact that everyone's being super engaged um, with our session today. Um, lots of questions, lots of really thought-provoking and insightful, I think, um, statements made, questions asked of Azran. I've certainly got so much from this short session. Uh, we will be sending a, a, along, you know, uh, the contact details for how you might reach out to, to Azran and his team, um, and indeed ourselves, if you feel that there is value in connecting with us further to explore some of these issues around um, high performance, stress management, uh, employee and um, well-being um, in, in the workplace. So um, um, and that, that's all we have time for for today. Uh, really, thank you so much. Azran, any last parting words before we sign off for the afternoon? Well, I, I know there's still a lot of unanswered questions, so, so please reach out. I'll, I'll definitely give my email address to Michelle. Uh, there's a lot more that we can help uh, with, and we, we, we really, really want to help. 
Wonderful. And uh, we've got this last um, this statement from Rosila Wati. Thank you so much, Azra and Michelle. We'll exercise my brain um, to focus on things that matter now. I think that's, that's, that's taking charge right now. There's so many things that are going on in the world, um, but not every one of them matters. So making that conscious decision that this is what matters to me right now, right here, and that's what I'm going to focus on. Power to you and to everyone else. Uh, thanks very much again, Azran, and to everyone else. Um, it's a wrap for today, and uh, we'll, we'll send the replay out, links out. Uh, please, uh, please keep an eye out for other webinars that we will be organizing continuously to bring value to the business community. And if indeed you have a topic that you think would be of value to you, uh, you know where to find me. I'm, I'm, I'm hopefully we're on LinkedIn, right? Tell us, tell us what you need to hear from us more. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.